Hey, welcome to Draft Academy. My name is Mike. In this tutorial, I'm gonna walk you guys through creating an ER diagram based off of some data requirements. So over here, I have this document. It's called Company Data Requirements. And basically what this document does is it describes all of the different data, all the pieces of information, and the relationships between those pieces of information. And this is a good example of a document that you know you might get if you're you know working for a company and they want you to design a database. Let's say that they want you to design a database to store information about a company. Well, they might give you this document and then your job would be to take this document and convert it into a database schema, which you can then you know store information in and all that. So this document will describe all of the data and it will describe the relationships between that data, but it'll do it in you know, in English, right? It'll do it in a very high level manner. You know, it's not gonna get into uh, database specifics or anything like that. So your job would be to uh, take this information and then you know design database schema uh, from it and so what you can do is you can take this you could convert it into an er diagram and then you could take that er diagram and convert it into a database schema so i'm going to show you guys the first step of that which would be to take a document like this and convert it into an er diagram which in the last video i kind of walked you guys through uh, what an er diagram was and, and all that stuff so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this document i'm going to read through it and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna design an ER diagram based off of it. So over here, it's just company data requirements. So we're defining uh, the, the data and all that stuff in a company. So it says the company is organized into branches. Each branch has a unique number, a name, and a particular employee who manages it. The company makes its money by selling to clients. Each client has a name and a unique number to identify it. The foundation of the company is its employees. Each employee has a name, birthday, sex, salary, and a unique number. An employee can work for one branch at a time and each branch will be managed by one of the employees that work there. We'll also wanna keep track of when the current manager started as manager. An employee can act as a supervisor for other employees at the branch. An employee may also act as a supervisor for, for employees at other branches. An employee can have at most one supervisor. A branch may handle a number of clients with each client having a name and a unique number to identify it. A single client may only be handled by one branch at a time. Employees can work with clients controlled by their branch to sell them stuff. If necessary, multiple employees can work with the same client. We want to keep track of how many dollars worth of stuff each employee sells to each client they work with. Many branches will need to work with suppliers to buy inventory. For each supplier, we'll keep track of their name and the type of product they're selling the branch. A single supplier may supply products to multiple branches. So this is our company data requirements document. And there's a lot here, right? It kind of took me like over, over a minute to go through and read all of this. And so if you're given a document like this, how do you go about converting this into a database schema? So the first thing we want to do is create an ER diagram. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through and show you guys how we can create an ER diagram for these data requirements. Okay. And then in the next video, I'll show you guys how you can convert that ER diagram into an actual database schema. So let's go ahead and take a look. I'm going to walk you guys through each line in that requirements document and we'll convert it into our ER diagram. So over here, it says the company is organized into branches. Each branch has a unique number and a name. So you'll notice I've uh, made bold branches. So branch is gonna be our entity, right? We're defining an entity branch and it's gonna have two attributes, a branch ID, which is gonna be our primary key, right? The, the branch has a unique number. So that to me tells me that it's gonna be the primary key and then obviously the branch name. Next, we have the company makes its money by selling to clients. So right away there, we have another entity. Each client has a name and a unique number to identify it. So here we have our client, which has their client ID, which identifies it, and then their client name, which is just gonna be the name. And then over here, it says the foundation of the company is its employees. Each employee has a name, birthday, sex, salary, and a unique number to identify it. So over here, we have our employee, and we have the employee ID, which is the primary key, birthday, name, so we get first and last name, and salary, and then sex. And then so over here, we also have a derived attribute, which is gonna be age. So from the employee's birth date, we could derive how old they are at any given point. So here we have our three entities that we got from this requirements document. So now over here, it says, the employee can work for one branch at a time. And so over here, 
we have a relationship, work for, right? This is like a verb. So an employee over here can work for a branch and a branch can have an employee working for it, right? So that's our relationship. And you'll notice over here, I defined these as total participation. So I'm saying that all branches must have employees working for them. That's this double line right here. And I'm also saying all employees must work for a branch. So both of those entities have a total participation in the works for relationship. And that wasn't rigorously defined inside of the document, but that's just something that I kind of, you know, set there as the person designing the ER diagram. And then over here we have our cardinality relationship. So I'm saying that basically what this says is that a branch can have any number of employees working for it and an employee can work for one branch. So I'm gonna say that one more time. And a branch can have any number of employees working for it, and an employee can work for one branch. That's what that cardinality relationship uh, is defining right there. So next we have another relationship. It says each branch will be managed by one of the employees that work there. We'll also wanna keep track of when the current manager started as manager. So over here we have another relationship which is managed, right? An employee can manage a branch. So employee can manage a branch and a branch can be managed by an employee. And then you'll also notice over here that on this relationship, we've defined an attribute. So we want to keep track of when the employee started as the manager, right? So when does the employee start as the manager? And that's what we're defining over here. So we're defining this attribute on the actual relationship. And now let's take a look at the participation. So all branches must have someone managing them. So you'll notice that we have this full participation here, right? Every branch is gonna participate in that manages relationship. All branches need to have a manager. But over here on the employee, it's partial participation, right? Not all employees need to be managers of a branch. In fact, by a large majority, most employees will not be the manager of a branch. And so that's why we defined this as single participation or partial participation. So not all employees are gonna manage a branch, but all branches will be managed by employees. And then over here, we have our cardinality relationships. So we're saying that an employee can manage one branch and a branch can be managed by one employee. So that kind of makes sense. So down here, we also have another relationship. It says an employee can act as a supervisor for other employees at the branch. An employee may also act as a supervisor for employees at other branches and an employee can have at most one supervisor. So over here, we get this supervision relationship. Now you'll notice that this supervision relationship is actually a relationship that an employee has to itself. So this is a relationship between employees. So over here, we have an employee can be supervised by another employee and an employee can be the supervisor of another employee, right? So over here, basically we're saying that an employee can be the supervisee of only one supervisor, right? So you can only have one supervisor, but an employee can supervise any number of employees. So one more time, I'll just say that an employee can be supervised by one other employee, one supervisor, and a supervisor can be the supervisor of any number of employees. All right, so over here, we have another relationship. It says a branch may handle a number of clients. However, a single client may only be handled by one branch at a time. So over here, we have this new relationship between the branch and the client. So I'm saying that a branch can handle a client and a client can be handled by a branch, right? So maybe a branch might have a bunch of clients that it works with, whatever. And so the client has a total participation in this relationship. That means that every client must be handled by a branch, but the branch has a partial participation, which means that not all branches need to have clients, right? Maybe you'd have like a corporate branch that doesn't work with any clients, or maybe you'd have like an R and D branch that doesn't work with clients, but you'd have other branches that do. And so that's why we would define that relationship. And then also we have our cardinality relationship, which would be a branch can handle any number of clients, right? So the branch can handle N clients and a client can be handled by one branch. So if you're a client, you can only work with one branch. But if you're a branch, you can work with multiple clients and that's what we're defining over here. All right, and then over here we have another relationship and I realize this is getting a little cluttered and I'm actually in the way, but it says employees can work with clients controlled by their branch to sell them stuff. If necessary, multiple employees can work with the same 
client. So now we have a relationship between employees and clients, right? So we have an employee works with a client and then a client can work with an employee. Now notice the participation. So all clients must work with an employee, but not all employees must work with clients, right? So all clients need to interact with the branch through an employee, but not all employees need to interact with clients. And you also see down here, it says, we'll want to keep track of how many dollars worth of stuff each employee sells to each client they work with. So on this works with relationship, we're defining this attribute, right? So the employee can sell to the client and the client can buy from the employee. And that's where we're getting this from. Finally, we'll look at the cardinality. So a client can work with any number of employees and an employee can work with any number of clients. And so that's uh, basically the relationship that we get from this line up here. All right, so over here we have our final little section of this requirements document. It says many branches will need to work with suppliers to buy inventory. For each supplier, we'll keep track of their name and the type of product they're selling the branch. A single supplier may supply products to multiple branches. So this is an example where we would need to use a weak entity and an identifying relationship. So over here we have this weak entity branch supplier and it has a supplier name and a supply type, but the branch supplier is going to supply a specific branch. Now we wanna keep track of which branch suppliers are supplying which branches. And in order to do that, we're gonna to have to use this identifying relationship. So we can say the branch supplier supplies a branch and a branch gets supplied by a supplier. And you can see that we have these cardinality ratios over here. So this is basically our entire ER diagram, right? We have from that requirements document, we've been able to map out all of the different entities, all the different attributes, on the entities and all of the different relationships. And basically we get this diagram. And this diagram is, it's just linking all of that information together, right? It's visually representing all of that information uh, in a way that is defining it. So what we can do now is we can take this ER diagram and depending on the different relationships, the different cardinality ratios, the different participations, we can actually go ahead and convert this into a database schema, which I'm gonna show you guys how to do in the next video. So stick around for that, and we'll go ahead and design our database based off this ER diagram. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe to Draft Academy to be the first to know when we release new content. Also, we're always looking to improve, so if you have any constructive criticism or questions or anything, leave a comment below. Finally, if you're enjoying Draft Academy and you want to help us grow, head over to draftacademy.com forward slash contribute and invest in our future.